Uh, I'm Dr. Alex Kelter, and on behalf of the Board of Directors and everyone at Breathe California, Sacramento Emigrant Trails, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Jackson today uh, as he gives us his talk entitled Designing Healthy Communities, Creating a Sustainable and Livable Sacramento Region. Tall order. Uh, I also want to thank the co-sponsors of this event, uh, the Sacramento Metropolitan AQMD, California Air Resources Board, Sacramento Area Bicycle Advocates, Walk Sacramento, the Environmental Council of Sacramento, and the Cleaner Air Partnership. Speaking for myself, I know there are plenty of times when I need to be reminded of the big picture, and as you'll see today, if you haven't already, nobody does that better than Dick Jackson. Today's program is really a perfect fit for Breathe California in its efforts to promote walkable, bikeable communities that improve air quality and also improve our quality of life. Breathe has been a champion in fighting for clean air since 1917, being a partner with young people, advocating for public policy, supporting air pollution research, and educating the public and policymakers. We're very pleased and very lucky that Dick could come to Sacramento to be with us today. Dick continues to be a leading voice for better urban design for the sake of public health. As a pediatrician, he's done extensive work on the effect of the environment, particularly on young people. He has served in many high-level leadership positions, including California, being the California State Health Officer and being the director of the Centers for Disease Control's Center for Environmental Health for, what, nine years? Dick was also the host and narrator of the four-hour PBS documentary, Designing Healthy Communities, and is co-author of the accompanying book, which really exists. There it is. He's currently chair of the Environmental Health Sciences Program at the UCLA School of Public Health. I remember introducing Dick over a decade ago at one of the annual California Childhood Injury and Violence Prevention Conferences. At the time, many of us were looking for a new paradigm in injury and violence protection that normalized the role of safety in the public health eff efforts to increase uh, physical activity, for example, advocating that more children walk to school. It was true then, and it's true now. Dick sees things that other people don't see, and he connects things that other people don't connect. And of course, we have a lot of words for people who see things other people don't <laughs> see. <laughs> and for a lot of us, uh, it's often quite a while before we learn how to recognize the difference between hallucinating and being a visionary. But fortunately, we've had over two decades now in Dick's case, and the results are very clear. So I take this opportunity to present to you my good friend, Dick Jackson. <laughs> it's always scary when you have an old friend introducing you, and um, that was the most benign uh, introduction you've ever done for me, so thank you, Alex. <laughs> It's humbling to be in this room, and I'll tell you a number of reasons. One, as I look out at this room, there is so much wisdom and smarts here that it's, it, everybody here knows more about a lot of the things I'm going to talk about. And I'm pretty good at skating and connecting big pieces, but the little pieces. The second reason it's humbling is it's named after Byron Sher. And Byron really was a friend and a hero. He didn't really know me, I was a lot younger, but boy, we dreamed up things to do with water protection, health protection. His staff person, Kip Lipper, was spectacular. And as I think about the legislature, I think about Nick Petras and what a wonderful and spectacular leader he was, particularly on pesticides and his concern about farm workers and his good, very good staff, Bruce uh, Jennings and also lots of other people. And I worked a lot with Ralph Lightstone or California Rural Legal Assistance. And we had really crazy ideas sometimes that came into being. We had the idea that 
pesticide tolerances ought to be safe. If it's legal on food, it ought to be safe. And that was the most radical thing people had ever heard in 1983 or 84. We had the idea you ought to benchmark how much allowable chemicals people were exposed to, to children. And it took eight years and finally became the law of the land, the Food Quality Protection Act in 1996 passed that unanimously in the United States Congress, the only environmental law in the last 30, 40 years in the US Congress. Um, we had a vision that we should really build communities that have the lowest carbon footprint as possible. And Daryl Steinberg and other leaders of very important work around SB 375, AB 32, and I, I hesitate to mention any more names because I'm going to leave someone out, but um, really so much, and I want the folks who are California government employees here, so much leadership for health in the state, particularly in LA where air quality was so bad, nationally, and around the world got started right here. And things that people thought were crazy became common sense over time. And so what I'm gonna talk about is gonna sound a little initially crazy, but I think it's common sense because we are in a moment of real threat, a, a moment of real crisis. And Sacramento has, is such an important leader in all of this. Um, these are my two books, uh, two of the recent books that we, I use the one on the left to teach at UCLA, and uh, the one on the right is the companion book for the video series. And um, I'll just go through some of the thoughts here. So when I trained at UCSF, I was there 1972, and we ran an event on the skyrocketing cost of medical care. Oh my God, 7% of all the money in the United States is going to medical care, and we thought that was mind-boggling. And you can see where we are now at 19%. And a friend of mine once said, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed because they were spending too much money on something that wasn't necessarily productive to the economy of that country. In their case, it was the military, and we're not too far from that ourselves. But in our case, it's the medical care system. So we've added 30 years to the average lifespan of Americans over the last century. 100 years ago, what was the leading cause of death in Sacramento 110 years ago? Malaria. Malaria. And because this was a swamp. You look at the old houses in Sacramento. The steps go way, way up because this place would flood all the time. And it was the environmental changes. Medical care improved our lifespan by about five years. The other 25 years came from changes in the environment infrastructure, and the other big eye, which was immunization. The two big eyes are what really improve lifespan in America. So we must be the healthiest people in the world, um, and we're number 46 for lifespans around the world, given how much money we spend. I, I was doing pediatrics at Moffitt Hospital in San Francisco, and I remember saying to the nurses in the intensive care nursery, actually they said to me, this is the third baby we've seen in two weeks with gastroschisis from Fresno. Gastroschisis is where the abdomen fails to close, the abdominal wall, and the intestines are protruding. And do you think there's some chemicals that they're using there? And I thought, I don't know. And then, a few weeks later, we had three babies with neural tube defects, failure of the closure of the spine. Do you think that's something in the environment? Oh, no, no, it's just a Poisson distribution. It's just randomness. And so when I went to public health school, I went to CDC and worked on smallpox eradication and a bunch of other things. But when I came back from that, I wanted to work on pesticides and environmental hazards. And it was hard work, it was all trade secret, it was all sitting in the Department of Food and Agriculture, there was no ability to measure really what was in the environment to any real degree, and there was no ability whatsoever to measure what was in people. And so began to pursue it, it was very hard. We ran into horrific problems, the cancer cluster at Rosamond, the cancer clusters at McFarland, people panicked and upset and angry. By the way, good things came out of that. And the good thing that came out of that was full reporting of all pesticide use in California. And the folks from DPR know we now have full reporting, and it's extraordinarily useful for epidemiology and for actually planning of how much toxic exposures we have in the country. But one of the things we do in pediatrics is when you bring your child or your grandchild into the dock, first thing they do is the height and weight. And because in pediatrics you're looking at the movie, 
you're not looking at snapshots. And you want to see that the progression is going in the right direction. So if your child comes in at 60th percentile for height, you want him to stay roughly at that and not either get too short or too big too fast. We're seeing about five children a day like this one. Comes in and the height is median for 50th percentile, the weight is 95th percentile. If your weight's that high, your blood pressure's going to be that high, your cholesterol's going to be high, and you really worry. Now, a good doctor isn't going to uh, immediately, or a good nurse, is not going to say, here, start taking these pills, but start going to bed at a reasonable hour. No junk food in the house. Snacks need to be fresh fruits and vegetables, good California-produced food. Um, blue light at bedtime keeps you awake. T being awake too long is a risk for obesity. No screens in the bedroom if you can get away with it. I know that's hard. And no soft drinks in the house. And two months after that, the child comes back. Has anything changed? No. And it's because the child cannot change his or her environment. And so two months after that, uh, and this is a theoretical story, but it's not made up by that much. The child's getting something for his blood pressure, something for his cholesterol, something for his blood sugar. And what I want to assert is that we have medicalized what is, in essence, environmental disease. And the environment is rigged against the child. It's rigged against the child's family. It's rigged against the doctor. And a lot of the docs that are Alex at my age are just burned out with medical care because they're sitting at the end of the disease pipeline and they're seeing five, eight people a day with diabetes or tobacco-related disease or other related diseases, and they feel helpless. And so the big lesson for all of us that do this after a while is we've got to move upstream. We've got to think about interventions that make it easier for people to be healthy because in America, we make it easy for you to be unhealthy. Think about the checkout line at the supermarket. They're not putting the fruits and vegetables in the checkout line. And by the way, um, the real cost of junk food has gone up, has gone down 50%. Sugar-related, fat-related, salt-related food is half the price of what it was in 1980. And the stuff that's good for us, and by the way, good for the California economy, is twice as expensive in real dollars as it was back in 1980. So, we're not making real progress in improving the life of Americans. My, my son, and some of you know Brendan, he's a, now a doc at CDC, and, but when he was in first year of college, he went to Costa Rica to work on, I think it was bromeliads in the rainforest, but um, he sent a note and he said, Dad, the people in Costa Rica have exactly the same lifespans as Americans. They live just as long as we do, and they spend seven times less on medical care. It's because they spend the money on, and Glenna Troche will tell you this, on prevention. They don't spend it entirely on treatment. So we're number 47. For the, so I was thinking about being in this room, and, and uh, this is a, a slide that is kind of a goofy slide, but it brings me back to coming to Sacramento in 1979, 1980. The first time I met Governor Brown, he was wearing a little plastic watch, and he would look very, he still looked rather Jesuitical at the time. And, uh, he was very worried about uh, medfly, and because I was doing pesticides, he said, we really have to think about malathion spring, and we want you to do this, this, and this. And his chief of staff, B.T. Collins, did this bioassay where he proved to the people of California that malathion wasn't bad for you. Actually, it was a stupid thing to do. B.T. would probably, if he's still alive, would agree. But it was a crazy time. People were shooting at helicopters. It was a very, and the state was spending I think the whole program cost $100 million, which is a lot of money back then, to do the Malathion Spring over all the Nobel Prize winners and everybody else in Silicon Valley. So it was a really intense time. And to make a long story short, one of the things that came out of that by connecting health with the concerns about the environment was we got a California birth defects registry. We got full reporting of pesticide use indirectly out of this link where people more and more conflated and began to think about environmental issues as health issues. I'm embarrassed to say what I'm going to say because you live in Sacramento, a lot of you. Sacramento sucked 30 years ago. It, you know, it come up and it would just be, oh, there weren't many of those beautiful old elm trees left even then. There were enormous parking lots, blacktop, that just baked in the sun. 
it was hard to find a place to eat. We'd go visit Department of Food and Ag for a meeting, and there's a little restaurant in the old folks' home next door with a swimming pool over your head. Some of you may remember that uh, place, the little cafe, but there was like almost nowhere to eat. There was no opera. There was no ballpark. There was no light rail. There was no beautiful parking structure with the most spectacular art piece five stories high on the side of it, and you know which one I'm talking about. And um, really didn't want to be there. So I, I'll jump forward. Um, because of a lot of vision, people putting in the light rail, creating the ballpark as an amenity that is social, the restaurants, the fact that the Bay Area is so unaffordable that young people move here because they'd rather live here than there, and I'll talk about other pressures that mean that Sacramento is going to get more and more people. I think it's one of the most spectacular places to live in America. And I'm not just saying that because I give talks around the country all the time. And people say, well, what should we do? I mean, <laughs> a month or two ago, I was in Jacksonville. So Jacksonville decided that they were going to be a center that people wanted to visit. They had a nice river, so they put a walkway in, but the walkway started, stopped, started, stopped, started, stopped. So nobody could actually walk a mile without having to walk through a bunch of vacant lots and go back out. Didn't attract people. So, well, people want to come to ball games. So they put in a football stadium and a soccer stadium with about 60 acres of parking around each one of them and couldn't figure out why there was no lively downtown for the other 322 days a year there isn't a ball game. Um, and then they put light rail in, but it was an elevated monorail that really was a pain in the neck and hardly anybody could use. And the coup de grace was they passed a law that they didn't want gay people. Um, and they didn't want, you know, uh, and if you look at almost every city in America, the urban pioneers are often the creative artistic people. Some of them are um, into, or, uh, uh, LGBT or otherwise, but the cultural stuff is really important. And I'll come back to culture because it has such an impact on what we're talking about in terms of the built environment and health. So Alex said, you know, I went off to CDC in 94, 20 years ago today. And uh, I got there and I said to my kids, we were living in Berkeley and of course, at a government salary and the three boys are in one bedroom. And I, I said, oh, we're going to go to Atlanta. You know, we go to Atlanta, you can get a dog and, and you can have your own bedroom each. We don't want to go, Dad. No, no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. So we moved to Atlanta and it's 94 degrees, 94 percent humidity. They were convinced Dad was the stupidest man in the world. And it was a tough haul for a long time. It was also um, I met with Dr. Satcher, the head of CDC, and I said, well, what's my job? And he goes, your job is to grow your center, and you're absolutely forbidden to lobby the Congress and do anything political in the process. So um, it, was, it was like landing up, I ended up in Washington, D.C. about one day a week, and it was like being in the fun house with the mirrors everywhere, trying to figure out exactly how to make this work. I finally did figure out how to make it work. Remind me at the end, and I'll tell you. So here's headquarters. Um, and my office was on Buford Highway, um, which is a state road, seven lanes wide, lined with the homes of the poor all the way up and down. Immigrants, African Americans, um, other people. A mile and a half between crosswalks. Highest pedestrian death rate in the state of Georgia, which has a very high pedestrian death rate. And people were jaywalking. You see the headline, jaywalker killed on Buford Highway. And of course, they were jaywalking because it's 94 degrees and they had to get the bus going the other way downtown. It was a mile to the crosswalk. And so I'm driving to a meeting one day and urgently, and I look over the side of the road and there's an elderly woman walking along. And I, I had been thinking these big issues about climate change and little issues about endocrine disruptors and chemicals in our environment, my atoms and molecules. I look over and here's this elderly woman struggling walking along and she's got a shopping bag, one in each hand and I'm, I want to pick her up and give her a ride because it's so hot and I don't do it and I go to the meeting and I, I get there and um, we're talking about big stuff and all I can think about is this poor lady and if she collapses and dies, the cause of death will be heat stroke and it won't be heat island effects, absence of trees, and if she's killed by a truck going by, the cause of death will be motor vehicle trauma, and it won't be absence of sidewalks, absence of public transportation, and poor allocation of the, of the city resources. And so uh, we went to the meeting, we talked about all this big stuff, and I kept thinking, you know, we in environmental health have spent a lot of time thinking about a lot of things, but what 
how you build environments really shape people's behavior. And one of the things I teach my students is the built environment is social policy in concrete. So the social policy is we want the poor people and the black people over on the west side of Syracuse, and we're going to put the wealthier people and the food stores and the restaurants and the hospitals over on the east side of Syracuse. And we're going to run Highway 91 straight up the middle, and those folks on the west side end up being more poor, more sick. A lot of them actually work in the hospital, and they have to take a cab to go the 100 yards to the hospital that they can see from the other side of the freeway because they've got to go all the way around. The social policy was to divide that community. And so we human beings are so adaptable that we look at the world and we think it's got to be this way. And so if you remember nothing else, we've got to start looking at the world and saying, how can we envision a world that is really healthy and works for people? Because as evanescent as our thoughts feel, ultimately they have huge implications for the world that our grandchildren and we are going to be living in. So our vision after World War II was, and I actually have learned a lot about this. I spent last fall at Roosevelt House studying Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal and other things and in New York City. Eisenhower came back from the Second World War having seen the Autobahns. And he thought, we need Autobahns in the United States. He was Supreme can Commander of the military. And you, know, you could bomb a railroad and it would not work you know, hundreds of miles, if you bomb a, a roadway, it's pretty easy to fix. So there was a whole defense, it was defense money that was used to build the biggest public works project in the history of the world until recently was the U.S. highway system. I also learned there was a second reason why we built the U.S. highway system, and it shocked me. Eisenhower and General Marshall, remember the Marshall Plan, and a bunch of the others, had been the generals, maybe they were colonels at the time, who had broken up the Veterans Army that marched on Washington, D.C. in the 1920s, command, demanding more jobs. And Ike knew the last thing they wanted to do was come back in 1945 and suddenly have 19 million servicemen and women being demobilized and have all that trouble. So how do we keep them busy? We're going to build a lot of housing. We're going to build more and more housing. And we're going to build roadways out to that housing. And so the sprawl was absolutely a, a, a deliberate decision, economic and social decision, aided and abetted by the petroleum industry and aided and abetted by uh, tire and cars and all the other industries. But it really did work for about the next 50 years. It was, sprawl was an economic engine. 25% of the GDP of the United States in the 20th century was related to cars and the needs of cars. We built three million of these homes. And I asked my students, what's the meta message of this building? What's the most important thing in that per family's life? In yeah, in the garage. Yeah, it, that, the family's wrapped around the garage. And in fact, if you have a garage door opener, you can live there and never meet one of your neighbors for years. In fact, most kids my age, when we were, knew everybody in our neighborhood. I bet folks in the room that were my age, you could go down even now and tell you who lived in the various houses on the street where you grew up. Kids today can't do it. We build neighborhoods that look like this. Uh, it's called a crush worm design. And, um, <laughs> and this is a picture of the California state flower. And, and they work really well because people can get to where they want to go quite well for the first five years. Of course, in LA, UCLA is right near the 405 freeway where it goes over Wilshire Boulevard. So Caltrans and the state and the Fed spent $3 billion fixing that roadway and intersection, and it still doesn't work. We keep adding more and more lanes, it doesn't work. So, I love this picture. <laughs> Speaks for itself. No. <laughs> but I'm desperately worried about climate change and fossil fuel loading of the atmosphere. But one-sixth of all the loading of CO2 into the atmosphere is the result of cutting down all the trees, our friends the trees. And trees in the forest are really important, but trees in urban areas are really important because they cool us down. We have removed 60,000 square miles of photosynthesis from planet Earth just in the United States, the, continent, the uh, continental United States. In fact, it's the equivalent area of Georgia, and just surface parking lots 
or the equivalent area of the island of Puerto Rico. Think about how much concrete is that. This, you know, you think, that, well, this is farmland that's been converted into housing, and you see this all the way up and down California. And you see it as a land use issue, but think about it as a health issue. The leading agricultural county in the United States in 1945 was Los Angeles. Imagine if the last crop hadn't been houses, and they decided half the land was going to be kept as um, urban gardens or production agriculture. Fruits and vegetables would be a lot cheaper and be a lot of meaningful work for people close to where they lived. And yes, so what? LA's got to build three-story buildings instead of one-story buildings, but it would still work. This slide came from Howie Frumpkin, but I love it. Um, it's a picture of uh, a new subdivision that's gone in in Florida, and you made friends with your neighbor on the other side of the fence, and you said, hey, let's get together on Labor Day, and we'll have hot dogs, we'll bring the kids over, we'll, uh, we'll swim in the pool, we'll have a good time, and you say, ah, come on over. Well, there's a fence there, you can't throw the baby over the fence, it's just not a good idea. So, you say, all right, well, I better drive over. But you don't quite know how to drive between the two houses, so you get your friend Google, and Google tells you that it's seven miles and 17 minutes apart between these two houses that are 17 yards apart. This is tongue in cheek, but it is a metaphor for what we've done in America. We have built for cars, we have not built for human beings. And if social policy and concrete's number one message, number two is build for human beings, build for human happiness. You know, I think driving a car, at least in LA, makes me unhappy. Um, it's just so stressful. Uh, and it has changed the quality of life. So women now drive twice as, mothers drive twice as much as their mothers did, mostly chauffeuring, who do twice as much as their mothers did. I actually, having the three sons, liked driving them to school um, because it was the only way that I could have conversations with a teenage boy about sex, drugs, and the dominant social paradigm. And, you know, Sex is a lot of fun, but it's, you know, it's really a lot of trouble, and you can, a lot of bad things can happen, you know. <laughs> I was, even though I'm a pediatrician, I wasn't any cooler than any other father. Um, <laughs> boys only talk to you when they're staring through the windshield, by the way. Eye-to-eye -eye contact does not work. This is Wilshire Boulevard. Finally, we're going to get a subway going out to UCLA. But 20 years ago, UCLA opposed the subway because their second source of revenue was parking and parking tickets. Now they're, they've gone from 800 bicycle, bicycle parking spaces to over 3,800, and they're really embracing bicycles. So I'm very proud of my employer at this point. But it, th this is uh, tough on people's quality of life. Alex was head of injury control, and leading cause of death, 3 to 34, was car crashes. What's the best thing we could do about car crash? A lot of things, less cars and a bunch of other things, but slowing the cars down. What do you think your chance of dying if you're hit by a car going 20 miles an hour is? It's about 5%. Your chance of dying if it's going 40 is um, 85%. So I've been leading this campaign on the UCLA campus that 20 is plenty. And as L as Sacramento thinks about how it's going to evolve into a happier, healthier place, maybe you're doing it already, but getting rid of one-way streets helps a lot. Putting more trees in the streets gives you a sense of speed. Putting in wider bike lanes and wider pedestrian lanes give people a sense of protection. I, I personally prefer separated bicycle lanes from uh, pedestrians, separated from cars, because I'm old and get easily scared, but um, that's another story. The, so 20 is plenty is the campaign we're running on the UCLA campus. You have no business driving faster on a campus than 20 miles an hour. Maybe it ought to be true for all of, it's true for Hoboken, it's true for a bunch of cities in Europe. Maybe it ought to be true for Sacramento. And, um, you know, figure out how to get people into town. You got wonderful transit. Well, your light rail is marvelous. Uh, was it um, Representative Eisenberg that was the one? Who was behind the light rail? Yeah, mainly, yeah. He really ought to get a medal for it because it's so wonderful. Sometimes I drive between, I hate to say this, drive between um, LA and San Francisco, uh, Berkeley, because I live there. And um, I'm, I buy five lottery tickets for death every time I do it. If a lottery ticket's one in a million, 
Every time you drive 87 miles, you buy one lottery ticket for death. So some of you in this room will drive 87 miles today, and you're buying a lottery ticket for death every single day, a one in a million lottery ticket. And yet in the environmental chemical world, we worried about one in a million lifetime exposure risks. And think about how many tickets we're buying. So really putting more emphasis on slowing cars down. And everything. But are more deaths in America caused by car crashes or air pollution? And at least for, uh, actually that slide's wrong. It probably should be worldwide. Um, it's air pollution worldwide. And Sacramento's um, US ranked 21 in 2012. I don't think you made the list in 2013. But the valley itself is um, certainly challenged by air pollution. Um, different slide for both ozone. Um, I don't see Sacramento on there. Particles and short-term particle pollution. Number five, thank you. Oh, there it is. Okay, so you ought to be, it's tough. But that's Sacramento as is Sacramento now. Under global warming scenarios, if Sacramento becomes as hot as Tucson, which is some of the things they're being called on, you're talking about a lot more ozone because you get much more production with the more sunlight and the more heat. Nancy Hughes is head of, and I'll say your organization incorrectly, Nancy, but uh, Urban Tree, California Urban Forest Center. And, you know, I don't know. I grew up in Nutley, New Jersey. It sounds like a stupid name, and it is, but it was named Nutley because it was covered with chestnut trees. It was a working class suburb, trolley car suburb, but it had a park that went through the center that went along the what we call the Third River. It was the creek. It was five miles long. It was designed by the Olmstead Sons. Um, all the trees were covered with, early on, with the chestnuts. Then it were replaced by elms. Then the elms all died, replaced by black oaks, and now the black oaks are dying. But still, it's a city where everybody wants to walk. Tr people won't walk, no matter how much I wag my finger at them, unless there's trees, unless there's shade, unless there's pleasant atmospheres for people to walk in. Lots of other benefits from trees, but those are a big one. I've already said this, that the temperature goes up, ozone goes up, and we tell our kids to exercise exactly at the time the ozone levels are the worst. Don't you think all the high school football games ought to be played at 9 in the morning instead of um, 6 at night? I don't think the parents would like that. But So how about a natural experiment? Could we do a natural experiment and see if air quality gets better if people don't drive so much? We did one. We had Carmageddon. We closed the 405 for a three-day weekend. Um, they dropped the Mulholland overpass onto the highway. And uh, everybody in LA was smiling. It was very strange. You were told, <laughs> don't go anywhere. Stay home. Bicycle to the beach. Do what you need to do. Cassie, wasn't it amazing? Uh, the, the whole vibes of the city were totally different during that time. But one of my uh, colleagues, Yifeng Zhu, I love this picture of her having the cocktail party out on the freeway there. <laughs> Um, that's not her, really. She measured air quality near the highway and not having the 405 filled with vehicles. Air quality improved 83%. Overall region, 75 Overall near region, 75%. And the whole region, 25%. Cars are bad for our health. Blood on the road and uh, junk in our lungs. So this marriage to cars has a series of burdens on us. You know, driving a car raises my blood pressure. It raises my cholesterol. It raises my adrenaline levels. It raises my cortisol level. My risk of having a heart attack in yours is higher while driving and higher for the several hours afterwards. But it also means that people spend a lot of time in their cars. They weigh, on average, about six pounds less, uh, six pounds more than people who live in very walkable areas. So here's obesity in 1991 in the United States, and here's obesity in 2010. Obesity rates in the U.S., average Americans gained about 27 pounds, and average 14-year-old girl about 14 pounds. And a lot of it's abdominal uh, girth obesity, which is more troubling and more of a health threat than actual gaining weight. One of the big points I want to make here is this is not about the individual. It's not about personal self-control. We have created a society that pushes us towards these health stresses. So one of Cassie's uh, colleagues, the students, did this nice survey of, of uh, billboards in Los Angeles. They went through Hollywood and they looked at 
rich neighborhood billboards and see what they advertise in rich neighborhood billboards. What do you think it looks like in a poor neighborhood? This is LeBray and Hawthorne. Eat stuff that's bad for you. Drink stuff that makes you overweight. Drink some more stuff that dissolves your brain. And then do everything we tell you to do and go get lap band surgery. Get yourself fixed because you've done everything we tell you to do. Where I'm going with this is the whole social thrust in America is pushing people towards ill health. As our weight goes up, our risk of becoming diabetic goes up. It goes up faster for women than it goes up for men. Pretty scary. I mean, I, this is shocking. Look at women's risk of becoming diabetic goes, is 90 times higher if she's severely obese. Here's diabetes in 94. I'm going quickly on this, but here's diabetes in 2007. We have doubled diabetes in 15 years in the United States. The percent of population with diabetes has gone from about 4% about to 8, 9, 10%, depending on what state you are. 2% of the entire GDP in the United States is going into diabetes. When I was a pediatrician going to the pediatric clinic, diabetes clinic, how many kids do you think I saw with type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes? None. You go into the clinic now, and half the kids have type 2 obesity-related diabetes. And just in the last month, studies have come out saying the survival on the type 2 kids so-called adult onset, is worse than it is for the children with type 1, the juvenile diabetics. And, no, and I think it's because a lot of these children have other comor what we call comorbidities, heart failure and, and a series of other issues, high blood pressure at the same time. So what's this got to do with environment and built environment? Here's a story, a study that came out in the last year. Very powerful, robust study. CDC does physical examinations, interviews, about 5,000 people a year. Here's a people in the prime of economic earning years of life, ages 20 to 64, 40 to 64. Compare them 20 years ago, look at them now. Do you think they got healthier or less healthy? Excellent health went from 30% to 13%. That's a big deal. When people say I'm not in good health, they're usually right. Can you get around or do you need help? 9 to 14 percent. Do you need a cane or a wheelchair? More than double percentage in the population. Think about the costs alone, not to mention the social and uh, other costs of having, these people are not that old. 60 is not that old. Gets younger all the time. Um, smoking went down, obesity went up. This is the one that amazes me. Dr. Bites, you'll really know regular physical activity went from 17% to 50% of the population. Why am I showing this in the Cal EPA? Because we're not, we have been wagging our fingers at people telling them to exercise for 30 to 40 years. Look at the great job we've done. It hasn't worked. The only thing we know really works is to create environments that are irresistible, that people want to walk in. I talk about my hometown. Everybody turns out, walks the parks all day Sunday. There's a, the school's over here. There's places that people retail, places that people want to go to. And if you're walking next to water, it makes you happy. I love your um, bikeway along the uh, American River and the Sacramento River, by the way. Congratulations, and congratulations to Mary Johnson's support for that. So. It's difficult in the situation we're in now. The threats that are on the horizon are pretty profound. This is the Keeling curve for CO2 in planet Earth. Um, I'm going to skip these. I apologize. But you all know that the rate of the temperatures have been going up, probably about a degree just in my son's lifetime, degree Fahrenheit in my son's lifetime on average on the planet. As the temperatures go up, the forests dry out. I, my middle son got married about um, month ago and I went camping with him up at Yosemite. Um, we just being with, with dad and the guy there for a week uh, camping in the high country and it broke my heart to drive in through Cleveland and I had no idea the enormity of that fi the Roman fire and just mile after mile looked like the surface of the moon a year later. So um, wildfires are more frequent and 
I'm worried about air pollution. If you're worried about air pollution, burning uh, an entire forest really is a major impact, as you well know. The oceans, because of all this CO2 we've put in the atmosphere, have become more acidic. And if you look at the National Climate Report from the federal government, it's shocking. It's shocking. It's about four months old now. pH of the ocean has actually dropped. Can you imagine? The pH of the entire ocean has dropped by about 0.02, but it's still significant enough. That means how much CO2 is being dissolved in the ocean to make it more acidic. And, um, and the oceans, of course, are expanding as they warm, but they're also uh, going up because of the melting of the thing. This is just a one-foot sea level rise in the Bay Area. Sacramento will not get impacted quite to the same degree as the Bay Area, except you will, because an awful lot of housing is going to be displaced when just a one-foot sea level rise. And this is going to happen in my children's lifetime, not even my grandchild. So, so long, if my child, grandchild lives long enough, it will in his, of course. So. Um, we have to think about how we can come up with solutions that fix the economy, fix health, fix the environment. You know, in medicine, we're always looking for the underlying disorder. And I remember seeing a patient with bacterial endocarditis and came in and he was having these hand problems and this problem and that problem. It was a list of about 20 different things. But it turned out what we had to do was find out that the inside of his heart was infected. And once we t dealt with that, all the other problems disappear. We've got to come up with solutions that can really treat a whole series of things. I don't even like the word co-benefits because it makes it means they're not as important. They're just manifestations of an underlying disease that we've got to get rid of. So um, I think number one is we've got to really think about where we live. We've got to build really good places. So more than half the young people in America now want to live in neighborhoods that are walkable and bikeable and have um, services. They don't have to be owned by their car. If your car owns you, it costs you about $10,000 to $20,000 a year in real dollars, not uh, mortgage payments, real dollars. And that's a lot of money for the average family. If you can get by with one car or no car, you're, you're putting money in your pocket. Um, we have to think about price support. So I put this in because I wanted you to know one day I was assigned to be the Secret Service man guarding Governor Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and uh, it was an event. Um, talking about how wonderful California agriculture was. And I, I liked it in part because we have no federal government sends $14 billion a year to the Midwest to support corn and soy and other commodity crops. How much money does the federal government send to California to support the growth of things that are good for us, like fruits and vegetables? Nothing. Nothing. And so I'm not I, I really do think we ought to be spending our taxpayers' dollars on making it easier for people to get healthy food. And it would be good for California agriculture, too. That's a win-win-win. Good for economy, good for the environment, good for health. In 1968, Alex, you didn't have one gram of high fructose corn sugar in your diet. And today, the average shelf disappearance in America is 63 pounds per person of high fructose corn sugar. Fructose is tough on your liver. I can't go through the physiology right now. But your body metabolizes it, and your liver metabolizes, similar to the way it metabolizes ethanol, alcohol. And you get enough on board, your liver turns to fat, and it looks like pre-cirrhosis of the liver. And so I've written a paper, actually, just recently submitted on why we need to disclose how much fructose is in food, the same way you would disclose how much alcohol is in, a, in something. We need to tax sugar-sweetened beverages. We know that the average consumption of of cigarettes in California now, the numbers are a little vague, but went from about 240 cigarettes packs per person per year 25 years ago down to about 100 packs per year now. It has really worked. And you can see lung cancer dropping and throat cancer dropping and a whole series of things dropping. Taxing has worked. We probably, not we, we definitely need to be taxing carbon. Capitalism works. If you make it more expensive, people will use less of it. And business people will figure out ways that a smart shopper can save money. This is a slide. This story just came out in the last week. Um, researchers at Stanford uh, came out with this study. I can't think of his name. It starts with an L, his name. But they looked at diet in the US, and the actual number of calories that people are consuming has not gone up that much. But the exercise levels have dropped dramatically. And they're arguing that you can explain the entire 
obesity epidemic by decreasing physical activity. So really it comes back to if we devise communities and design communities that make it easy for people to be physically active, make it easier for w walking around, make it easier to socialize, make it easier to be with people we care about and love. Have you ever seen anybody on a bicycle frowning? Sometimes, pouring rain maybe. Most of the time they're smiling, you know? And the leading cause of, of one of the leading morbidities in America is depression. And physical exercise works as well as Zoloft for countering depression. So when we make it hard for people to exercise, we're depriving them of life, years of life. When we make it hard for them to exercise, we're depriving them of freedom. They have to have a car. And we're, making, we're depriving them of happiness. And that's pretty un-American to deprive people of those things, I would say. So people with prediabetes sounds pretty awful. Your doctor says you got prediabetes. But you go out and start walking about a half hour a day for six months, and you reduce your risk of becoming diabetic by about 60%. No drug works as well as physical exercise, physical activity. No drug. With virtually no complications. No side effects. If you're my age and you start exercising a half hour a day, your brain gets bigger by about 1.5% on MRIs, which is pretty cool. And your brain size actually correlates with brain function um, as you get older in life. And if you don't exercise, it shrinks by about 1.5%. So these are good things. I put this in for a reason. This is a, a pretty cool looking set of parking meters in Washington, D.C. But it sends a message, too. And parking meters, and I was with Don Shoup, who's the world's expert on parking. He's a professor at UCLA. And he gave a talk about Pasadena versus Westwood. Pasadena was totally depressed 30 years ago. Westwood was the cool place that people wanted to be near UCLA. Now if you go to Southern California, Pasadena's, down, old Pasadena's completely cool. The sidewalks are wide, they're clean, the stores are all full, there are no empty stores, the alleys are beautiful, people walk down the alleys and find nice shops. People love being in old Pasadena. You go to Westwood and it looks awful. The sidewalks are heaved. It's, um, they're, they're working hard to keep them clean, but it's just not very welcoming. And three quarters of the storefronts are empty. What do you think happened 20 years ago? It's pretty wild. They made the decision in old Pasadena that all the money that went into the parking meters would go to fixing up the storefronts and the sidewalks and the pedestrian realm. And the business people said, you mean to tell me that, because um, they, they didn't want parking meters and, and they wanted them to be cheap. They said, no, no, we're going to make them expensive so people keep moving. We're going to have them work day and night, even on weekends, but all the money is going to go into fixing up the boulevards around here. None of it will go outside the community. They're not going to use it to pay off lawsuits for people tripping on the sidewalk because we're going to fix the sidewalks. That's only a little tongue in cheek in Los Angeles, by the way, what I'm just saying. Um, and if you try and walk in certain places, so the sidewalks are so poorly maintained, it's awful. So he said every city in America absolutely does need parking meters, and absolutely that money should go to fix the public realm because people will embrace what is, in fact, a tax, if you will, the meters, to go to things that really matter to them. So you can put in street trees using that money. So it was cool because I never thought of parking meters being a good thing. I always thought they were a pain. But you know, if it makes the place happier and more pleasant and puts in street furniture and trees and cleans the streets and gets the gum off the sidewalks, great. So that's business. Here's the Academy of Pediatrics. My pediatric friends, if I say to a senior pediatrician, what are you most worried about with the young families? Well, they might talk about hepatitis or meningi meningitis vaccine or HPV vaccine. But they often talk about the fact that young families are under so much stress and kids get so much attention so much of the time because parents are so afraid of the larger world. And we need to have more comedy, more socialization in the world that we are in. And this is the Academy of Pediatrics saying kids need to grow up in neighborhoods where they have increasing autonomy, increasing ability to walk, increasing ability to take on the world. Ah, this is the parking structure near Union Station in Washington, D.C., and I noticed two police vehicles right there. 
It's sort of a metaphor for America because I thought to myself, I wonder what they cost. And I wonder how many calories you burn on them. So it turns out one police vehicle costs $5,000 and you burn 200 calories an hour. And the other police vehicle costs less than $1,000 and you burn three times as many calories. So I love the fact that in, these are ads for the Segway and for the uh, police mountain bike that the cops on the mountain bike are skinnier than the cops on the Segways. I, you know, I always talk to the police at the Capitol here on the mountain bikes and I say, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Do you like this better or would you rather be in a patrol car? Oh, we're all fighting to do the mountain bike patrol because it's, you know, we can stay in shape and it's just much better than sitting in a car all day long. Institute of Med, I teach my students that if it's boring, it must be important. <laughs> so like the Senate Rules Committee and uh, a series of other things. So um, OMB, Office of Management and Budget, must be really boring. Um, here's the Institute of Medicine. They were asked, huge study, look at the obesity epidemic in the United States. They came out with 14, 15 recommendations. The first recommendation. Build communities that make it easier for people to access physical activity. And this is the, me the established medicine saying do this. There's lots of research going on. The last prior to 19, this issue that we did of American Journal of Public Health on built environment and health, only 50 articles. And the 10 years after, over 600 articles. The general plans all need to have health elements. They need to be integrated through the entire general plan and they need to have standalone elements. And um, every county health department, Glenna should have somebody that goes over to the planning committee meetings, planning commission meetings and says, hey, what you're doing, how's it going to affect health? And the health officers have been great. I'm teasing you a little bit, but the health officers have been terrific on this. Um, I think if you build with more density and more trees, you produce less CO2 People don't have to drive so much. This is data, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip it. Light rail really works. So here's, I don't know if they've done a study here in Sacramento, but here's a study in Charlotte where they put the light rail in and people started taking light rail to work. And the people took light rail to work lost about six pounds over the next two years. And the people that uh, um, didn't take light rail, and, and and they were more like the people that did take light rail are more likely to meet the certain general's guidelines for physical activity. So maybe the governor needs to think about a justification for the high speed rail up and down the state and think about the fact that every 80 miles somebody dies, um, a one in a million chance of dying, and think about some of the costs, the health costs of not having the high speed rail, not simply the economic and environmental costs. I'm going to skip these. Sorry, this is important. Do you do a Ciclavia in Sacramento? Um, this has been so important. The Ciclavia, it started in Bogota, Colombia, and you shut down a main boulevard, and everybody turns out in bicycles. First time it happened in LA, the LAPD said, no, we don't want it. The transportation people, no, MTA, no, we don't want it. Everybody said, we don't want it. They put it in place. 250,000 people showed up. They were all smiling. The businesses did very well along the boulevard. And um, it created a whole identity and belief around bicycling as a good thing rather than something weird for people in spandex. So, um, and it, this slide's a little out of place, but I want a picture of that beautiful parking structure um, plate because on, I think it's 18th, 16th, there's the five story parking structure with the beautiful um, Aztec sun piece that's five stories high. I've never seen anybody walk along and take a picture of a parking structure in my life. <laughs> and I think the 1% set aside for art that the state has done has been so important and use the art lever, the crowbar, to open up um, these issues as well. American Institute of Architects now is making health on a par with design. U.S. Green Building Council, the people that give out LEED certification are now making health on a par with sustainability. The Urban Land Institute, who are the biggest developers in the country, who tried to get me fired 10 years ago, have now embraced healthy buildings for new developments. And Alex, can you imagine the developers putting, look at number one, put people first. Sound familiar? And look at number five. I love it. This is really what we're talking about. We have to make it easy for people to be healthy. 
instead of making it hard and expensive and difficult. So those would be some of my big takeaways. Um, let me stop. I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm obsessed with urban river parkways. If you want people to walk, want them to be active, want them to smile, want them to be happy, create a feature near water because people want that. Kids want it. Old folks want it. Everybody wants it. I'm sorry. These stencils about no dumping drains to the bay, et cetera. Well, uh, Sacramento ought to invest in these stencils. So with that, let me stop and thank you so much. It's a pleasure and there's so much wisdom in this room. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Want to do a short q and I'll do whatever you want. And uh, I'm a little over. I apologize. Say your name if you don't mind, please. My name is Peter. My name is Peter Jacobson. Thank you for being here. I've been hearing this message now probably for 10 years or maybe more. And it's just not out there in the public at all. I mean, the decisions on how we build our communities just doesn't seem to be in with the people. So I'm hearing all the facts and all this sort of stuff, but how do we make the change? How do we get the public to accept it? How do we even get the newspaper to accept it? The news newspaper did an editorial about better biking downtown. It didn't mention health. How do we actually affect change? See, I think we're, it is happening. And when you've got 58% of people looking to buy a house, in a place that is walkable and bikeable, the it has to bubble up from the bottom. It bubbles down from the it comes from the top too. So California and Caltrans deserves credit because I think is that 172 million or 72 million is now going into safe routes to schools. And the big philosophical change, I know it's still small and they build small stuff, but you got to start. And my friend Howie Frumkin, co-author, says public health really does work. Public health, we convince people to wear seat belts, eat less red meat, use a condom, and get a colonoscopy. And over time, it, it's generational, though. And um, so I will tell you, my students, the young people, get this far more profoundly. And we're trying to put bike routes in certain parts of LA. And folks that look like me, you know, older white folks that have been there for 40 years, we don't want it. It's going to ruin our neighborhood. People will come on their bikes and steal my big screen TV. All this nonsense. But the young people get it. So it, it, may, it's going to, it took us three generations, four generations to make what we did. I think we're making real progress. To have the biggest developers in the country say do this is really remarkable. And one of the biggest developments, they started out by selling the houses in terms of sustainability and green. Turned out when they flipped the message and said, our development's about health and happiness sales went right right up so really creating places that help us connect with each other counts for a lot